In this little stand, there are approximately 50,000 wheat seeds. To make a few loaves of bread, each of those 50,000 seeds has to be removed from the tip of the grass that it's growing on. And then it has to be popped out of its tiny individual wrapping. All 50,000 seeds are encased in what's called a hull or a husk, and each tiny one has to be unwrapped before anybody can eat it. When you consider the scale of the challenge, it's hard to understand how most people for the last 10,000 years or so have survived primarily on grains. And yet when you process grains yourself by hand, you can see, you can come to understand how it was possible. I mean, it's a lot of backbreaking work and a lot can go wrong, but it is possible. I'm quite happy to pay farmers to do this for me with modern combines and such, but if you're curious about how this was done the old-fashioned way, come with me. First step, of course, is to get the wheat out of the field, and you have to wait for just the right moment. When the grains have grown to their maximum size and nutrition content, and when the plants have started to dry down. Really, when it's dried down most of the way. If the wheat isn't dry, if it's still a little green, the only way to get the seeds out is literally one at a time with your fingers. That's not gonna scale, as the business school bros say, so you have to let the plant complete its whole life cycle and literally die in the field. Oh beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain. You know, I'm not exactly the uh, target market for patriotic songs, but I always liked that one, especially the amber waves part, and now I finally understand it. To invoke the image of amber grain is not the same thing as invoking the image of, like, green trees. A field of grain is green most of its life. It only dries and goes amber in the last few weeks before harvest. So to invoke the image of amber grain is to invoke the abundance of the harvest. The song isn't just saying, wow, we grow a lot of grain in America. The song is saying, we have a lot of grain that is ripe and ready to be plucked like an apple. If only it were so easy. Farmers traditionally would pull out a single grain and crush it with their thumbnail to assess its ripeness. This is, I think, the late milk stage, when the starchy endosperm is still a little liquid. Here is what I think is the soft dough stage, where the starch is going powdery, that's almost dry enough. If you leave it drying in the field for too long, the heads will shatter. That is, a stiff wind will come by and just blow the seeds off the plant and onto the ground. That is, of course, the goal from the plant's perspective. Its goal is to protect its seed from animals and from the elements until the seed is fully grown, and then it is to drop those seeds into the wind where they can go off and then grow into the next generation. That's what the plant is trying to do. A farmer has to wait for just the right moment when the plant is about to shatter, but it hasn't quite shattered yet. And over thousands of years, farmers crossbred and selected for varieties that dried out but resisted shattering for at least a few weeks, giving you some kind of window in which to gather up a massive labor force, wait for the right weather, go out there and reap the harvest. Still, there was and is a lot of urgency to the harvest. It has to be done at just the right time and done really quickly. Here's one for you, Brits. In the year 1066, the last Anglo-Saxon king of England, Harold Godwinson, knew that William of Normandy was planning an invasion. Harold gathered an army and a fleet of ships, and he hung out on the south coast, waiting all summer for William to cross the channel and attack. William never came, but September did, and Harold had to let most of his men go. They needed to get back to their farms to gather in the harvest of summer wheat before it shattered right there in the fields, fell onto the ground, and germinated. If that had happened, they would have had a great head start on the winter wheat planting, but they would have had nothing to eat in the meantime. What's the point of winning the war if you're all going to starve? With Harold's fleet disbanded and his army elsewhere, William was able to cross the channel, establish a beachhead at Pevensey, and the rest is uh, history which you could learn about on Audible, the sponsor of this video. Whether I'm cooking in the kitchen or digging in the garden, this is going to be my new vegetable garden, Audible is an amazing way for me to stay informed and entertained while I'm doing something else. 
One by one, the several kingdoms of the Anglo-Saxons fell. Audible is the leading provider of spoken audio content. History audiobooks are generally my jam these days, but they got fiction, everything, including the latest bestsellers. With an Audible membership, you get a credit to download one premium title a month, and then you own it. You also get unlimited access to the Plus catalog, which is basically everything beyond the latest bestsellers, all the back catalog stuff, plus Audible original programs, guided fitness and meditation, ad-free versions of top podcasts, unlimited access to all of that with your Audible membership. New members can try it for free for 30 days with my link in the description, audible.com slash Adam Ragusea. Or you can text Adam Ragusea to 500-500. Try Audible for free for 30 days with my link in the description. Thank you, Audible. Imagine if ancient people could have listened to books while they reaped the harvest. I suppose it would have been noisy, as the harvest was an all-hands-on-deck affair. You need a huge crew out there with sickles. A sickle, of course, is this curved blade, and you kind of swipe at the base of the straw, and the sickle gathers up the straw into a nice tidy little bunch before it then cuts them off at the base. And then with the other hand, you grab that little bunch, and there you go. You have a nice tidy what's called a shock of wheat. When the Soviets were choosing a farm implement to represent the rural peasantry in their alliance with the industrial proletariat, the sickle was the perfect choice, way better than something like a plow. As we discussed previously in the part one video that is linked in the description, planting wheat is actually not that much work. If I'm a landowner, I can plant my own grain field myself, or maybe with my sons, or with a small group of hired hands. Once it's time to harvest the wheat, however, you need a giant crew of people to get down on their hands and knees with scythes. This is one reason why it behooved landowners to maintain a perpetual landless underclass who would show up and do the job at exactly the right time. The sickle is the tool of those poor bastards. No wonder they eventually stood up and reaped the bourgeoisie's heads instead. I could not use a sickle, though, myself, because my wheat had lodged or fallen over. We talked about this last time, how important it was that in the 20th century, people invented these modern semi-dwarf wheat varieties that will not fall over. If the wheat is lodged in a tangled mass on the ground, really the only way to get it up is to reach down with a knife or clippers or something and cut a few stems at a time. Then you got to straighten them out and then stack them up into neat little shocks pretty much one at a time. It took me half a day to get my little stand harvested, and boy did my back hurt at the end. Oh hey, check it out, oats! I planted the only wheat I could find, which was just a bag of animal feed wheat, and it was clearly a mash of all kinds of random things, including oats. Oats have these kind of elegant dangly heads, and the seeds inside are super long and pointy before they are steamed and rolled flat into instant oatmeal. Time now to thresh the wheat, that is to knock the seeds off of the straw to shatter those heads. One precision method that I've seen for this is to put your shock head first into some kind of sack. I'm using a pillowcase. Then you bash the heads like they owe your boss money. You like to play the ponies, huh? Then theoretically, you can just pull out the bunch of decapitated straw and your shattered wheat is contained in the sack. I got hardly anything by using this method, and I got the feeling I was going to expend more calories than I created. The problem was that it wasn't dry enough. I needed to dry or cure my wheat until it was brittle enough that those heads would just break apart much more easily. Farmers traditionally did this out in the fields in rows of cut straw called windrows, or maybe in stacks of shocks with their heads up where they won't get wet and start germinating in the ground. I just laid my crop out on my front walkway and let them dry in the brutal southern sun, which it did. This also had the advantage of killing or driving away the thousands and thousands of aphids and other bugs who had infested my wheat. They were all gone after a week of drying, and my wheat seemed like it would shatter much more easily. But I decided against the pillowcase method because I didn't want my neighbors to call the cops on me, and also because I wanted to do it the way that most ancient people would have done it, the way that you can scale up into proto-mass production to feed a whole village. 
Let's call it the kill them all and let God sort them out method. You just bash up the wheat on a piece of flat ground known as a threshing floor. You smash it, you step on it, you throw it around, whatever. Just cause as much destruction as you can right down there on the ground. The most effective technique that I found was to grind everything against the ground with my hands, though I got a lot of splinters in my hands doing that because each grain is connected to a long hair-like thing called an awn that is the wheat's beard. If you look really closely, those hairs are like serrated knives. These are supposed to help the seed kind of hook itself into the ground and get established. But I still have a lot of these little guys embedded in my skin. You can see why people invented all kinds of tools for just smashing the wheat on the threshing floor. And once you have completely pulverized it, you sweep it up with a broom. And where, historically speaking, would you have gotten a broom? The seeds are way heavier, smoother, and smaller, so they sink to the bottom of that pile as you sweep. You can just lift the straw up off the top and stack it. And right there, you can see why grain agriculture historically went hand in glove with animal agriculture. Most of what we've created here is cellulose, a carbohydrate that humans can't digest, but some animals can. Feed the straw to them. And if you're like me, you've always wondered about these words. Straw is the stemmy byproduct product of grain cultivation. Hay is a similar thing, but it's not a byproduct. Hay is a crop you grow just so you can cut it down, let it dry, and roll it up and feed it to the animals, seeds and all. Speaking of nomenclature, let's resume our list from the last video where we are counting up common words or phrases that have their origin in the cultivation of grains because it is time to winnow our wheat, winnow it down. We gotta remove all of the stuff in here that is not stuff we want to eat, most notably the hull. That's what these little parchments are there, the husk, the hull. It's just indigestible cellulose. And with ripe modern bread wheat varieties, the hull just falls falls off during the threshing phase. That was not always the case. Dr. Catherine Zabinski of Montana State University writes about this in her book, Amber Waves, The Extraordinary Biography of Wheat. The earliest wheats that were used, emmer and einkorn, they had one more thick protective layer that you would first have to use something like a mortar and pestle and pound it off. Or, you know, you could soak them and you could char them over a fire and then they would more easily pound off. And then what you would have left is that hard seed. So one of the reasons that bread wheat and, and durum um, really took off was that hard layer, the hull, it's still present, but they're really fragile. Like it's just a easily dropped. For, you don't have to think too much about it. You do have to think about how you get it out of your pile, but this part is surprisingly easy. Traditionally, you would wait for a windy day, then you would just throw the wheat into the air. I didn't have time to wait for that, so I got out my box fan and dropped the wheat in front of it. The heavy aerodynamic seeds fall straight down, while the papery hulls and tiny bits of straw just blow away. It's really pretty remarkable. You have to do it several times, but very gradually, you separate the wheat from the chaff. That chaff is also considered high-grade animal feed. And there's also probably a lot of stray seeds just hanging out there on the threshing floor. Rather than let them go to waste, you could bring your chickens over and let them glean the threshing floor. Let them eat whatever you can't eat so that you can then eat them. It works. I still have lots of big pieces of straw and maybe some rocks and stuff in there, so I needed to winnow this down further. A pizza screen was the perfect filter for getting out anything bigger than a kernel of wheat. And then I used a sieve, a fine screen, to get out anything smaller than a kernel. Look at all that sand from the threshing floor, yikes. My yield from a 50 square foot stand of wheat was almost four pounds of whole grain wheat, which is not bad. Though keep in mind, you'd have to set a lot of that aside for planting the next crop. The easiest way to eat all of those grains would be to boil them into a porridge. But you gotta remember that humans started eating grains long before they invented water and fire safe vessels in which to cook food, cook wet food. So really their only option was to grind it down into a digestible powder flour. Historically, this was an incredibly laborious process involving stone tools that I was not up for, so blender. You can't get as fine a grain with a blender 
as you get with real milling tools, but that's not bad. Coarse ground whole wheat flour, the original flour for the original bread. As I was kneading it, I could tell that I had very little gluten in there, the proteins that make doughs and bread stretchy and elastic. This means I might have gotten some soft wheat in my feed bag as opposed to hard wheat, high protein wheat for bread making. It may also mean that much of what was in that bag was actually barley, a grain that is virtually identical to wheat but has a lot less gluten. Anyway, this loaf was pretty crumbly, not very fluffy or chewy, and speaking of texture, it was full of sand from my front walkway. Edible, but pretty disgusting. Historically, how did people winnow out all of the sand and dirt from their threshing floor? They didn't. Their teeth were terrible. They had pocked teeth all the time. And think about this. If you actually, instead of putting it in your blender, which doesn't fall apart when you use it, you had one rock that you used to grind your seeds on top of another rock, they had, you know, little rock fragments mixed in with their wheat all the time. So, you know, really a good indication of a ancient people eating wheat is their teeth are terrible with, you know, little nicks out of them everywhere. Personally, I'd much rather boil my grains into a soup or a porridge, but that would have to wait for the invention of pottery, which is an incredibly momentous event in the history of food that we'll talk about another day.